So that's the first thing that excellence at that level in the aesthetic perfection creates this shock, which makes us therefore feel silent, speechless, and very small. You become small in the face of something so grand, so good. Secondly, what it does is that it creates all, all, how we do it, all, which results in the in the feeling of what I will call reverence, yeah. reverence, as well as inspiration by teasing our own passions. Moreover, cultural work thus presented equips us to enter into the experience of others and it makes it possible to cultivate and compare sensibilities, tastes that could in turn trigger solidarity across human experiences. They don't put the good job with it. They don't put the good job Let me leave the definitions there for the time being. I'm going to make Somali a little bit with, with English. Yeah. 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 Let me move on then to topic, subtopics. It took me two, two months to work on this, my friend. <laughs> Somalis will have to learn other languages. <laughs> if you're in Britain, you have to speak English. No due respect. No due respect. Subtopics. So let me speak then about the four topics that I have suggested that I will speak on them rather very briefly. And the first one is intellectual production. And intellectuals as cultural producers. The great Edward Said, in his 1996 magnificent essay, The Limits of Artistic Imagination and the Secular Intellectual, identified six primary roles for intellectual. These three stand out for me, although he talked about six, but I'll give you three that stand out for me. Intellectual production and intellectuals engage in what it calls archival work. You know what, having a library. This library is a building for archives, things to be kept there so that others will refer to them. Archival because they create counter information that defies, if not tells, the lie about hegemonic consensus. And thus, to quote Sa'id, privilege human agency and responsible choice. So that's number one. Number two of the intellectual, Sayyid Sa'id, is that intellectual production is interpretive and epistemological. Interpretive and epistemological. What that means, therefore, is that intellectual production requires that one masters you master spatialized idiom. Pejoratively, we call this jargon. Yeah. But spatialized idiom, specialized language, tied to particular classes, not just you, but other classes, corporate guilds, for example, and then translated those idiom into language that can be understood by the common people, at least educated common people, and therefore open to others to engage in this. So it says that this includes demystification of the context by articulating enduring issues of war and peace, justice, human rights, and genuine development. The third thing that Sayyid talks about in terms of the work of intellectuals as cultural producers is that intellectuals are also what he calls moralists, moral, moralists. And that means that they express distant claims distant claims, and argue for principles where the prevailing climate usually counsels experience. That's not enough for intellectuals. They have to articulate the things that need to be done that are in the future, 
not just what is possible today, but what ought to be possible in the future. So moral questions and vision questions. Now, I'd like to add then to Saeed's work one more concept, and that is the work of synthesis, the importance of synthesis. In a brilliant conception, Emmanuel Wallerstein, the great sociologist, proposes that the intellectual operates at three levels. Level one, the intellectual is an analyst. Someone who is in search of truth. You analyze something so that you can find what the truth is. That's the first task. The second task of the intellectual, he says, Emmanuel Wallerstein, is that the intellectual is a moral person in search of the good and the beautiful. The good and the beautiful. Not just the truth, but also the good and the beautiful. And then the third part, thing that an intellectual does in his work, or her work, he says, is that it's, a, it, 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 it's about politics. And that is, as a political person, the intellectual seeks to unify the true and the good and the beautiful. To be able to unify the true runta, to unify those that requires ideas. Ideas and knowledge then that make us challenge the existing reality at any given time and try to move beyond that reality at that time. Now, about two decades ago, in an exclusive essay, the South African painter, another artist, who also a poet, Breiton Breitenbach, wrote that and I quote, artistic creations do not reflect life. Artistic creations do not reflect life. In fact, he says, they are life-like and constitute life of their own. There is much, I think, to that perspective. But to be sure, artistic work is more than a reflex of our own immediate mood. And yet, there is something undeniable about the intimacy of art and the complexity of human life. The greatness and indispensability of art, declares Frederick Nietzsche, lies precisely in its being able to produce the appearance of a simpler world, a shorter solution of the riddle of life. No one who suffers from life can do without this appearance just as no one can do without sleep. <coughs> art, says Nietzsche, art exists so that the bow shall not break. That's life. So to keep it like that so it doesn't break, he says, we need art like we need sleep. Let me leave the intellectuals there for the time being and talk about music. I think a major element of the artistic creativity, music that is, music underscores the dialectical role of art as at once a release of human imagination and it is best virtuosity playing at that peak level and the response to the pressures of everyday life. <laughs> Music suggests the unforgettable Canadian pianist, Glyn Gould. Glyn Gould says, music is home from negation. It is but very small security against the void of negation that surrounds us. End of quote. Now, akin to other forms of art, then, one might propose that music, among the oldest of components of human cultures, makes an appearance in the contemporary epoch in at least four guises. One, music, the continuation of age-old aesthetic appeal and love of harmony that disrupts private and personal sensibilities. Imagine, my friends, for a moment, the explosive sensation and the sweetening of life that accompanies this Canadian genius, Glyn Gould. If you ever heard him play, yeah, uh, listen to Glenn Gould and see what he does to your sensibility. As he exhibits 
rhythmic inclusiveness on the piano. Or in the Somali context, behold the masters, such as Hussein Bajuni, Ahmed Ismail Hudaydi, Ahmed Daj, Umar Dula, or Dawood Ali Mas'af, playing the classical tunes such as Bird al on the road. Just listen to that at that level. They own the door, who did it? What, 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 and he plays, Amanaji plays, Daoud plays, Bajuni plays, he's dead now. But they play, everybody. Fatima is there, you feel this. And all, all there, there is a message in this that you belong together as people. And that musical instrument and the virtuosity of his hands brings us together that there is something here that others might not be able to relate to. Third, music is a mechanism to spread one tradition for another. One tradition to another. Somali to, for example, Ethiopia. Or Somali or English. Or Somali or Arabic. Or Somali and Sawahili. Have you ever heard Asha Abdu singing in, in, in Somali? And then turns around and sings in Sawahili. And then turns around and, and sings in Arabic. Yeah? Music can create that kind of a communication between different cultures and peoples. And then fourth, music is also business. It carries the law of value through commodification in a historical social system whose logic and its survival yeah, are based on constant expansion. So mu music becomes a commodity that is sold across seas and across lands and across civilizations. Though the personal and the communal may not be bereft of materialist value, they nonetheless touch upon passions that trigger and then hold together intense individual and collective sensations. In a moment of originality that privileges the exceptional power of music, Rousseau, the great French philosopher, writes, and I quote, one of the great advantages the musicians enjoys is that she or he can paint things that cannot be heard, whereas the painter cannot represent things that cannot be seen. The musician's art consists in substituting for the imperceptible image of the object, that of the emotions which that object's presence excites in the beholder's heart. Rousseau continues, it will not only chain up the sea, fan the flames of conflagration, but will also depict the desolation of dreadful deserts, dust the walls of subterranean dungeons, abase the storm, clear and still the air, and from the orchestra spread renewed freshness from the woodlands. Music, it will exist, he says, in the soul, the very same sentiments which one experiences upon seeing them. So that much for music for now. We'll come back to them a little later. Talk a little bit about poetry. Of course, yeah? Poetry. Why does poetry matter? Why? For Somalis, this should be a special question here, because that's the only great point that the world has given us, that we are people of poetry, nation of bards, they used to call us over 200, 300 years ago. The epic and early 18th century English romantic poet, Shelley, in his, quote, in his uh, uh, a defense of essay, a defense of poetry, tells us, and I quote, Shelley, poetry enlarges the circumstances of the imagination by replenishing it with thoughts of ever new delight, which have the power of attracting and assimilating to the, to the nature of all other thoughts, and which form new intervals and interstices whose void forever craves fresh food. Shelley says, poetry strengthens the faculty, which is the organ of moral nature of man in the same manner as exercise exercise, strengths, and live the body. That's how important 
poetry is for shadow. It can make us aware of realities that demand. Secondly, poetry is important because it can make us aware of realities that demand involvement in politics. Whether it's here in Britain or in the Somali society. Listen to the legendary Abdullah Sultan Timahat nearly 50 years ago. Africa is what the Dafadi and the Wakan always say. Diba Loga joke said the Markay the Winter Rugen. Lagad Rub Dora Galap Kui, Das Kusarai. Tare by Hornima a shape. Logumati Kaini Ninka and Uddog Daban Yaha, Lomaso Tare, Dyer Nalas the Wapota, Doh Ado Tare. You get, the, you get the point. And then he continues, a long point, so I won't go through all of it, but he continues. Togonima Somali wa lo budogale, hadumbay do da de santai, hadumbay do ye santai, shayedi delay, imikala do ndonaya, diri yata rode, dan Somali ya la mahaye wa da bal kale, shabi yita gala da ogala, da tansu yade, the store ya upon a yan. And you were doning me. Nina do it by Hamad Fadilla. I would the bad digging. You get the idea. Come again, who are you going to see the idea? The Mahatma. Poetry is also important because it can activate our place in the natural world, in the environment, the natural world, and among us other creatures, not just human beings. In other words, poetry creates a language that often is inspired by nature and natural objects, such as mountains, rivers, lakes, flowers, trees, or creatures like a horse. You have Abdullah Hassan in Finin. You go to that comment, he's talking about horse. But the image that he creates are stunning. Or it can be a lion, an elephant, a gazelle, Remember that famous Somali song of about 40 years ago, In the Derele? In that Derele? In the Derele? You remember that? Those of you who are musically minded? Or this. Kela, Murku Dararan, Yai Labanin, Dukta, Yai Dukta, Yai So it takes you, once you see this a, 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 a group of, of, of uh, camels, she camels, in a wonderful place, rains have, have taken place, plenty of grass and water, and a lot of milk. And the image that it creates is not just about this particular camel, it's the whole environment that it calls you to. So, it sh so poetry sharpens our appreciation for the beauty and abundance of the physical world, or sensitizes us to the struggle against environmental desiccation and environmental destruction. All of the above, therefore, calls us back to nature. Fourth, poetry propels us to free our imagination, enrich our modes of expression, that is the creation of new vocabulary through metaphor, the essential tool in the craft of poetry, metaphor. Metaphor is a figure of speech which presents an opportunity to see a thing in terms of another. You see one thing in relationship to another. See one thing in terms of another. That's the capacity to pick similarities and differences. Aristotle, the great philosopher of long time ago, suggested that a poet was someone with extraordinary ability to see likenesses, similarities. That's what the poet is. Poetry also is important, finally, because it can replenish our spirituality. By what? By doing what? By instructing us to talk about our own lives. Yeah. Sin Lei, yeah. uh, that long, yeah. Uh, yeah. so many different poets contributed to this. But they were talking about our lives. So poetry helps us to talk about our lives. Poetry also inspires us how to not only talk about our lives, but how to conduct our lives. What's the best way to live? How do we conduct our lives? You listen to them, He's always talking about this, about how to live a good life and how to conduct one's life. Or for that matter, other great poets. 
سواء عربي سواء المرة تمام بولها so many others poetry is also important because it helps us become conscious about possibilities the possibilities what we what we can let's see that the poet can see and what can be possible therefore and encourages us therefore to look for possibilities and not be satisfied with the present Poetry finally also helps us to come to terms with the ultimate. And the ultimate, of course, is death. It helps us come to terms with death. And it therefore, as we begin to look at death in the face, each one of us begins to think about the legacy, what you leave behind for others. And poetry is very important, inspiring people, therefore, not only to have the courage to die, because you have to die, but the courage. But at the same time, to think about after that in terms of legacy or what you leave for others behind. And the final then topic I want to discuss is religion. Very important. It will take a whole seminar to do that. According to Durkheim, the great uh, sociologist and anthropologist of religion, religion is the organized effort to close the abyss, the abyss to death. To close the abyss between what we know or could know and the mysterious or the unknown. How to bring those two together, what we know and we can discover and we know, and what we cannot know or we, we don't know. It is the therefore helps us, religion helps us to close that gap as much as humanly possible between what we know or we could know and the mysterious and the unknown. The first, therefore, what we could know is identified as the, the profane universe called Durkheim course, the profane everyday life, profane universe, or the quotidian, the ordinary experience, the latter, the mysterious, the unknown, and the source, the sacred, the exceptional world beyond the human experience. Second element about religion is that science itself is like in many ways similar to religion. Because science is also a way in which human beings have invented. So that they make an attempt, scientists make an attempt to see if they can connect the known, what we know now, to what we do not know yet. To make that discovery, that connection. So religion and science really, therefore, are very important sources of knowledge, both of them. The third thing about religion, any religion, not just ours, but any religion, connects us to external power, external power. It settles our engagement with the world that ultimately offers an anchor within the volatility of everyday experience and collective endeavors. Everyday experience is very unstable in life, everyday experience. It might, therefore, in the end, religion that is, in the end, help us to deal with human pain and the humiliation of poverty, for example. How does one live with pain in life? Deep poverty and pain. Religion becomes this one way of trying to understand that and come to terms with that, even when you cannot solve all the problems. This is stabilization in the face of chaotic life. Religion as a source of stabilization is primarily realized through rituals yeah, things that are repeated again and again and again through the generations and the millennia. Rituals. Best demonstrated, the best way to demonstrate that, of course, of rituals is to worship God. That's the, that's the most important ritual. Yeah? Standing in front of God and worshiping God, Allah. Yeah. Most important uh, 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 ritual. Ramadan, therefore, in many ways, at one level, Ramadan is a very healthy exercise. You empty the belly and dry it up and maybe lose a little bit of weight. Those of you who are overweight, I'm not, but those of you who might be. Yeah? Healthy, that is. But underneath that health, though, it's a ritual also. It's getting closer to God. Yeah? It's getting closer to God. So the ritual of Ramadan, in many ways, is one step to get closer to God for that month, deeper than the other perhaps uh, 11 months. Religion, therefore, and finally, and this is very important for Somalis, whatever they are, I think, we live in very 
terminal 